Well, good morning. Good morning, everyone. I haven't had a chance to run around and give everybody hugs, but I'll do that soon. Welcome, church. Now is the time to silence your cell phones if you've got those devices with you here and the volumes are up. You can lower those. I just want to welcome you. You are the church. You're the church because Jesus lives inside of you through the Holy Spirit. So church is wherever we gather, right? We take church to the farmer's market. We take church to the grocery store. Church, wherever you go, wherever you go, you are the church. And that's pretty exciting because that means we don't have to have a building. We can have a building. It's nice to have a building. Isn't it nice to be in here, right? I think Mark turned the air on this morning, which is, which will make it comfortable for everybody. But the good news is that wherever we go, whether we're under a gazebo, whether we're out in the parking lot, hanging out, we are the church. And so I'm just glad that whether you're here in the living room or whether you're on Zoom, good morning everybody on Zoom, you're the church too, even in your homes, wherever you are. So this morning, as we lift our eyes to the one who makes us the church, Jesus. Jesus is the center of the center. Say that with me. Jesus is the center of of the center. He is why we're here. Let's worship Jesus. Let's get a yay, yahoo for Jesus. Anyway, good day, everyone. Welcome to Cornerstone. During life, we can get so busy, so we're so glad that you made the great choice and chose to be with us here today. So today is someone's birthday who is very special to us, and she is our Pastor Ann's mom, Joan Horton. So let's sing happy birthday to her. And I just looked, and my mom is on Zoom. So hi, Mom. Uh, happy birthday. So today is not only my mom's birthday, but it's also my sister's birthday. My mom gave birth to my sister on her birthday. I don't know if that's a good thing or not. I don't know. <laughs> Giving birth is hard. It's a lot of work. So um, my sister, who some of you have met. How many of you have met my sister, Carol? OK, about half of you. So my sister donates to this church. So does my mom. So does my daughter. <laughs> It's a family affair, right? So we're going to sing to Carol, even though she hasn't been here in person for about a year, I think. She came and sang with me about a year ago. Um, we're going to go ahead and sing to her, and I'm going to send her the link to the video just so uh, she can feel the love from her Cornerstone family. Okay, so happy birthday to Joan and Carol. Not to be confused with Joan Carol, because that's actually my mom's name, Joan Carol. So Joan and Carol. <laughs> okay, here we go. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday dear Joan and Carol, happy birthday to you, Woo. happy birthday, and we're not going to sing to Megan and Jesus, but um, do uh, give them your love if you have their contact info, their Four years on the 22nd. I know, right? My mind is blown. Anyway, uh, happy birthday to my mom and to my sister, and happy anniversary to my daughter and son in law. So, here are today's order of services, and as you can see, Pastor Mark will be giving a sermon entitled 77. 
and it's based on Matthew 18, 21 through 35 on forgiveness. Looking forward to that. Please be sure to check your e-bulletin for this coming week's activities. Everything's the same except the Saturday Bible study is currently on break through the end of September and will be picked back up on Saturday, October 7th. If you would like to join in, please contact Pastor Lee for the Zoom link. As we've been announcing, the Wednesday night discussion group is going through a series on comparative religion. We are now currently tracing on how the church went from the days of Jesus through the current day with over 40,000 denominations in the world today. That's a lot of denominations, 40,000. So it's really, really interesting, and I've been to it. So I highly recommend it. So please join in. If you haven't previously joined in, you can watch the first five discussions on Cornerstone's YouTube channel or website if this interests you. And please feel free to join in on Zoom on Wednesday evenings from 7 to 8 p.m. It's really, really interesting um, to compare all the religions. So. Please join if you can. This Thursday, Bible Study Cafe for Women will be on week six of the series entitled 40 Verses to Ignite Your Faith. Each of the sessions can stand alone. So even if you haven't joined in, please feel free to join us on Zoom on this Thursday from 1030 a.m through 12.30 p.m. for prayer and study. Okay, so please mark your calendars for a week from this Thursday, which is September 28th. It will be the Lemon Grove Mobile Farmers Market's one-year anniversary. Cornerstone will be introducing some day camp games and activities, and we need your help. Um, so um, there will be lots of things to do, uh, and it will be a lot of fun. So please be sure to see Anne or Marguerite when she gets back in the swing of things. Hi, Marguerite. Yay, you're here. Um, you're just back. Last night, Marguerite just came in from her five-week trip. I can't wait to hear about how her trip went. I'm sure it went great in Europe. So glad to see you again, Marguerite. Um, anyway, please be sure to see either of them for how you can help at the Lemon Grove Farmer's Market one-year anniversary one week from this Thursday. September 28th from 4 to 7 p.m. Okay, you are invited to Wilma's memorial service, which will be on Monday, September 25th at 12 noon at the Chapel of the Roses at 3838 Bonita Road. The, the family would love to have Wilma's church family join them in remembering and celebrating Wilma, and we all know that Wilma is in such a great place right now, but we, we do really miss her a lot. So if you can make it, please be sure to attend. We care about you, and we want to be praying for you, so please do send us your prayer request. You can either text, phone, or email Virginia, who is our prayer coordinator, or Pastor Ann, or Pastor Mark. Also, please be sure to include in your prayers Wilma's family as they mourn over the loss of our dear sister Wilma. In addition to praying for Wilma, there are so many disasters in the world, but please be sure to pray for the Morocco earthquake victims. There is now over currently 3,000 people dead from that earthquake and over 5,000 people injured. 
So they really need our prayers to get back up and, and, you know, get back to living life. And it's so horrible. And in, in addition to that, please pray for the victims of the Libya flooding, where there are over 11,000 people dead. So just please pray for them. And yeah, such disasters and awfulness. Um, anyway. So now let's let's pray to our dear Father and Jesus, our Savior and Holy Spirit. Dear Father, our Creator, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Holy Spirit, our communicator, I pray to you. Thank you for so much for letting us all be here today to learn more about you, to worship and praise you you are so good to us we are just so blessed just to know you i want to lift up my dear sister wilma's family as they mourn and grieve over our dear sister wilma i also want to pray and lift up all those victims of the morocco earthquake as well as the victims of the libya flooding and just I pray for peace in this world. There is so much turmoil and angst and everything. And I just want to pray to you, dear Father, to please let us be able to listen clearly and understand your message for um, that you will have through our Pastor Mark's sermon entitled 77 on Forgiveness. Sometimes it can be so hard for us to forgive other people um, as we per perceive that they might, may have did us wrong. But, but uh, you know, if we just need to lay our lives down to you and just leave it to you, dear Father. You know, you know everything. We cannot control anything. We are so human, and, and you are our creator, our maker. And we love you so much. So, so just please let us learn how to live down our life and, and how, let you have control our, over our life. And I love you, dear Father, and Jesus Christ, our Savior, Holy Spirit, our communicator. Through Jesus Christ, amen. Beautiful, Alice. Thank you. Can I give these to you, Cassie? All right. Well, it is our vision and offering time. Hi, Paula. Marguerite. Wow. This is a special day. Sorry, Zoomers. You're missing out. <laughs> oh, you'll have to come join us. <laughs> Rub it in. I know. Well, I'm, I'm going to make this fairly quick today. Last week, we watched a video from our denominational president and we talked about very, very shortly and briefly about play sharing. But I know some of you who are very linear are like, when is she going to finish the alphabet, right? Okay, so we're going to add a letter to the play sharing alphabet. So first slide, I just want to uh, remind everybody what play sharing is. For those of you who maybe haven't been here with us the whole time or you just need a reminder, Next slide. They say you have to say things seven times before people actually get it. So <laughs> maybe this is my seventh time. I don't know. Place sharing is a posture of relating where one shares the place of another. It's sitting next to somebody sharing their place. It's deeply relational. It requires empathy and being with somebody. Not condescending, but being with, coming alongside. It's a way that respects and calls out how the other person is made in the image of God. Even if they don't claim to be a Christian, they're made in the image of God. And we get to call that out. It's understanding that all ministry happens in relationship. You're probably sick of hearing me say this. I know I've said this more than seven times. It's all about relationships. Relationships are the goal, not just a tool of ministry. We don't use relationships to manipulate somebody to get to them to do something. Relationships are the goal. It is participating in and the presence and mission of Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate place share. He came down into our flesh, which is very weak and broken, and he, he was with us, and now he's in us through the Spirit. 
which we celebrate. Okay, so our letter today, next slide, is O. And this letter actually, funny enough, kind of goes along with the sermon. The letter O stands for offer grace to others and yourself. Offer grace to others and yourself. And you might think, why get offering grace to somebody else, right? They hurt me and I need to forgive them. But offering grace to yourself, she wants to give you a pen. <laughs> we have a lot going on here. We're handing out pens and papers. And uh, if you're at home and you would like a, a full copy of this ABC list printed out so you don't have to write everything down, just let me know. I'll print you what we have so far. We only have like four letters left, I think. So O is offer grace to others and yourself. And I am a firm believer that if you've actually experienced God's grace, like where you've really messed up and you know God has forgiven you, you are more likely to give grace to other people. If you are not forgiving yourself and you're holding a grudge against yourself or you are holding yourself uh, condemned for whatever it is you did many years ago and you're living in the condemnation of that, you're going to have a hard time giving grace to other people. So if you meet somebody who's not very forgiving, just remember, maybe it's because they are under condemnation themselves. And then pray. Pray for grace to cover them and to fall over them and to wash over them. So we're going to hear more about forgiveness today. And grace and forgiveness sometimes are interchangeable. But when you are working with people in community, we all have broken edges. And we all bump into each other. And we all offend each other. And we hurt each other. And I'm not going to ask for a show of hands of how many of you have been hurt and offended by somebody in this room. Because <laughs> it was probably me. I don't know. <laughs> so we have to have grace for each other. We walk by grace because we're under grace. And there's nothing we can do to lose that grace from Jesus. Now, he would love for us to not hurt each other. But he is patient with us, and he's going to reform us, and he's going to change us. We're not, we're not saying just, oh, just be a jerk and, like, offend everybody in the room. That's not what we're saying. I'm saying we're on a journey of growth. We're on a journey where we want to love our neighbor as ourself. But we're, we're human, and we're going to make some big mistakes, and we're going to hurt each other, especially when we live in such a small community like this. And so offer grace to the person you're play sharing with, and offer grace to yourself. And if you missed a play sharing opportunity, offer grace to yourself. It's okay. It's okay. You might be, oh, I, sh I was talking to this person at the farmer's market, and I all I was thinking about was myself and what I needed to do, and I didn't pay attention to what that person was saying. Uh, and then you kick yourself, right? No. I mean, you can kick yourself, but then say, okay, you know what? I'll get a chance next Thursday. I'm under grace. Claim the grace and say, God will, God will reach that person through someone else because I, I kind of missed that opportunity. It's okay. God still loves you exactly as much as he loved you before. And if you did everything perfect, he wouldn't love you anymore. And that frees us up to go ahead and just pursue Jesus and pursue the Jesus in the other person. When we're sitting across and talking to each other after church today, try to see the Jesus in the other person. It changes your perspective. And allow grace for yourself and for the other. So, reporting on our thermometer, yes, we might have one more week of this. I'll just tell you, we are only $76 away from meeting our third goal. And so, it might happen this week. It's just possible, just looking at the averages. We have raised totally, if you look at the top under facility fund, 18924 And so... We're really close to our $7,500 goal for furniture and appliances. So maybe next week that we will have completed this chart. And then um, we'll talk on Monday with the advisory council about what we want to do next. Do we want to keep raising money? Do we want to sit? What do we need to do? We're looking to look at the budget. We're starting our budget for next year. So you all can pray for the advisory council on Monday. And just as we make plans for the future and as we patiently wait. I see Clotilde in there. Thank you, Clotilde. <laughs> I told you last week Clot God gave Clotilde the word wait. And so we are actively waiting and patiently waiting 
for whatever God has in store for us. And we've got some money tucked away. It's not a ton when you talk about building out a building, right, Seth? I mean, 20000 or 19000 I think we'll have is is enough to do something, but it's not enough to re, like remodel a whole building. So maybe we'll keep raising money. We'll see. But um, I just want to thank you for your faithful generosity. It's astounding to me that we've raised this much money with our little church. And there is possibility of more money coming from other churches that are closing. So we're just waiting for all the ducks to get in a row. And then we'll, we'll be ready when God is ready. So, next slide, if you'd like to give even a couple dollars toward that $76 goal to, to get us to the end of our, our third thermometer, you can add it to your regular offering, text to give at 619-825-2488. You can also click on the Give button on our website, cornerstonecommunityonline.org, or write a check or money order and mail it to our P.O. box or put it in the basket on the table. And I just want to say thank you. Bless you, church, as you give. get an amen an amen yes we we sing with joy to God because of what he's done for us and we're going to rehearse that today and I'm going to teach you a new song that talks about that very thing about having joy in the house of the Lord and I want to just read a couple of oh, before I do that okay so I want you to put both your hands out in front of you okay and in your right hand, I want, close, go ahead and close your eyes. In your right hand, I want you to visualize what brings you joy. Just something that brings you joy. It could be simple, it could be profound. Something that brings you joy. And in your left hand, I want you to visualize something that steals your joy. Maybe there's something stealing your joy right now. What is it? Okay, with your right hand, go ahead and fold it closed and put it close to your heart. Hang on to that. Whatever it is, it's bringing you joy. And you can decide what to do with, with what's in your left hand. You can toss it up. You can throw it. You can crush it. You can give it to God at the altar and say, man, I don't even know how to let go of this thing that's stealing my joy. Let's have a moment with God and decide what to do with what's in your left hand, the thing that is robbing you of your joy.
All right. Now put your hands together, fold them together in prayer. God, we proclaim that you are the author of our joy. And we pray in Jesus' name that you will get rid of the things that steal our joy, not our happiness. Happiness is situational. But God, our joy, our deep-rooted joy, the peace that you give us, it's in you that we pray. Amen. Will you please stand? So the chorus of the song goes, there's joy in the house of the Lord today and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Our God is surely in this place and we won't be quiet. We're gonna shout out your praise. So feel free to worship however you need to as you're learning a new song. Some of you can clap and still learn new songs. Some of you can snap. Some of you just need to read. Some of you can sing. Whatever you need to do, you are safe in this place. identities that are not true. So this bridge goes, we were the beggars. Now we're royalty. We were the prisoners imprisoned by maybe the things in your left hand, right? Now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing that with me. We were the beggars. Now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing that again. We were the beggars, now we're royalty. We were the prisoners, now we're running free. We are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house. 
Are you 
Proclaim your greatness, Jesus. We thank you for your grace, your forgiveness, and we thank you for the new identity you have given us. We praise you. We sing for joy in the house today. And all God's children said, amen. You may have a seat. Good morning to all of you here in the house. A special welcome back to Paula. Paula, make sure you give John our love. For sure, we miss him. And we've missed you. I Yeah, well, some of us have our priorities. I'm recording it, by the way. No. And welcome back to Marguerite. She landed yesterday, and we just... 
we gave her the benefit of the doubt that she would need to uh, catch up on her sleep, rest. There's this thing called jet lag that can really mess you up. And maybe she's in that flow where, where she's awake now, but uh, in a few hours, <laughs> she might not be. So welcome back. Welcome back. You look wonderful. Yes. <laughs> Scottish rejuvenation. Fantastic. And welcome to all you Zoomnificant people. <laughs> that, well, I try, to, I try to come up with a new one every week. So it's good to see all of you on Zoom. And welcome here today. We're going to start in Genesis chapter 4. Our text for today is in Matthew 18, but there's a common phrase, a common word in both of these texts. And so we'll start out with the first one. We'll go back to the beginning, or, or close to the beginning, in Genesis 4. So you remember Adam and Eve had two sons, and they didn't quite get along. One was quite jealous of the other, so much so that he killed him. Anybody know their names? You remember their names? Cain and Abel, yes, Cain killed Abel. Five generations later, there was a man named Lamech. And Lamech had a run-in. Well, let's, let's first read uh, Genesis 4, verse 15, because you remember, Cain killed Abel, and God said, What have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be restless, a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth and whoever finds me will kill but the Lord said to him in verse 15, Not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain so that no one who found him would kill him. And so Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Like I said, five generations later, Cain had kids and their had kids, had kids and had kids and had kids, all to Lamech. Just five generations. And Lamech writes this little ditty, this little poem. And he said this to his wives, Adah and Zillah, listen to me. Wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me. So somebody came up to Lamech and they had a little row, you know, a little fisticuff. I don't know if it was just a verbal argument. The Bible doesn't tell us what kind of wounding it was to Lamech. But Lamech says, I have killed him for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. This was Lamech's attitude. And I would have to say that it's part in one sense, part of our nature, part of our natural response. When somebody does something to you, you want to get them back. And sadly, we don't want to just get them back to the measure that they did to us. We want to one-up it and double up it and triple up it and quadruple up it. Seventy-seven times up it. And when we read in the Bible... This was probably the attitude of a lot of people. Vengeance, revenge. If you hurt me, I'm going to hurt you and your family. And that person says, well, if you hurt me and you hurt my family, I'm going to hurt you and your family and your whole tribe. This vicious cycle of violence. And we know that the world was a mess at the time, and this was, this was probably the mindset of a lot of people because Lamech is the father of Noah. 
And we know that in Noah's time, it says in Genesis, I believe, chapter 6, God saw how great the wickedness had become on the earth, and the inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only on evil all the time. So this was a rough time to live. Can you imagine if everybody had this 77 times attitude of vengeance? And we're going to see in a little bit that 77 times wasn't just, okay, I have a chalkboard and I'm going, to reven- I'm going to get vengeance. One tick, two tick, three tick, all the way to 76. Oh, I'm almost at 77. This better be a good vengeance. This better be it because that's the last. This 77 is representative of countless times without limit. It just keeps going and going and going. And we see this play out. In the, in the Hebrew Scriptures, in the Old Testament, and sadly we see it play out even today. When people are wronged, they want to get the person back. Even more than they were wronged. And this sadly plays out in cultures. One culture pitted against the next. One tribe or group of people against the next. Or even nations. Seventy-seven times. Just that number, if we took it as a literal number, is a lot, isn't it? But it doesn't just mean 77 times. It's an attitude, it's a mindset, it's countless times. Ongoing. Let's go to Matthew 18, verse 21 through 35. We're going to look at the text that comes just before this in a little bit. We're going to jump right into it. Jesus has been talking about forgiveness and reconciliation and how that works when a brother wrongs you. And so this is kind of the, the, the environment that Peter asks this question. Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Now we're going to read through this and then go back and take it piece by piece. So Seth, I'm going to go through the next three slides, I think it is, and then we'll jump back to this one, to the beginning. Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but, ooh, 70 times. Seven times. Next slide. Therefore, so he says, this is how many times you're to forgive. Talking about forgiveness. Therefore, because of this 77 times, which we see is an attitude, a mindset, and yes, the 77 here means countless, unlimited times. Because of that, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Anybody have a different translation from bags of gold? 10,000 talents. talents, yes. Ten, oh, he was a gifted person. He had 10,000 talents. He could play instruments and work on the computer and fix his car. 10,000 talents. 10,000 bags of gold was, was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master, the Lord, the king, ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when the servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, 
He went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay back the debt. And when the other fellow servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and went and told their master, the Lord, the king, everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? And in anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all that he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. I think I need to pray. Right now, Father, Son, and Spirit, give us wisdom. May we receive your grace and your mercy and give us understanding and give us hearts of forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you ever feel like that? You read a text and, oh, I have got to pray because <laughs> this is a tough one. Jesus says, this is how my heavenly Father will treat you unless you forgive. So let's go back to the beginning, not the Genesis beginning, but this beginning. So in, in this atmosphere, this environment of forgiveness, Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Now, the, the traditional number of times that you forgave someone, and I would imagine it's for the same offense, was three times. And you were probably considered a pretty decent human being if you were able to forgive somebody who had wronged you three times. And knowing that that was the tradition, Peter, and we're finding out that Peter's this kind of person who kind of likes to show off a little bit, raise his hand first and have the answer and talk the loudest and tell Jesus what to do and what not to do. And he's... he's probably continuing trying to get into Jesus's good graces. Look at me. I'm going to say, with, if three is the tradition, I'm going to say seven times. A little pat on the back. Wouldn't that be great, Jesus? <laughs> seven times. He was probably hoping Jesus would say, no, four. You know, let's go above the tradition of three, but let's not get crazy <laughs> with forgiving seven times, four, and then Peter, you know. No, this Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. And again, the, 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 the Greek word for, for this and the way it's used means without limit. Some of your texts may read 70 times seven, which is? 490, right? 490. I kind of like the 77 times better. You know, 490, I got to forgive 490 times. But the point isn't the number. It's not the number. It could have been 4,900. It could have been any, any number, but that's not the point that Jesus is trying to make. It's without limit. Next slide. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold or 10,000 talents was brought to him. I think some texts say servant, some others say slave. And when I hear slave, I think of an indentured slave, someone who doesn't own anything, right? The master owns him and they may live on the property uh, and all they do is do work for the slave owner, the landowner, the king, the lord, the master, and they really don't make money. But there are a lot of texts that say servant. And this, this could have been a servant who did a lot for the king. Some say that he could have been responsible for collecting tax revenue for a province under the king's reign or under his jurisdiction. 
And that, because the question is, how, how wait, wait, 10,000 talents, 10,000 bags of gold, how does a slave, or even if it's a high-positioned servant, how, why would the king, if, it, if it's a debt, did the king loan him this much money, this much stuff? What? It's kind of hard to figure out. Perhaps this servant who was in charge of collecting tax revenue was skimming a lot off the top, right? And this is an audit, right, Alice? Settling accounts, it's an audit. And it's been discovered that this one servant has been pocketing all, a lot of the tax revenue that is due to the king, and he owes the king 10,000 talents. Some of you may be wondering... How much is 10,000 talents? And what do they mean, 10,000 bags of gold? Why would you say 10,000 bags of gold instead of talents? This Greek word here, I'm not going to pronounce it because I can't, <laughs> but it's the highest number that existed in the Greek culture, 10,000. So if it's the highest number, it's a lot. It's the highest number. There was none greater and so this use of a kind of like a fairy tale sum of money simply could not, people couldn't imagine more, right? Remember a few years ago, maybe a couple of decades ago, if you heard that somebody had a million dollars, it was like, wow, it's like a fairy tale if I had a million dollars. Oh, a million dollars doesn't go as far as it used to. So right now it's, oh, okay, you'll be through that in a couple of years. Now it's like a billion, you know, billionaires. People are like, oh, wow an unimaginable sum of money, or when people win the lottery, multiple billions or a billion dollars, it's, wow, I can't even wrap my mind around it. Well, get a load of what 10,000 talents is. And I'm going to use how it was used, talents was used back then, and then take the monetary exchange to today's currency and how much that would be. It was said that, well, in a talent is more of a measure of weight. It's a weight of gold. It's a measure of weight more than it is a currency, right? We have dollar bills, and a talent was, was an accumulation or a weight of an amount of money, typically gold. And one talent or one bag of gold it's said to equal 20 years' wages, right? You work for 20 years, and that would be a talent, a bag of gold. So if it was equal to 20 years' wages, and there are 10,000 of them, 20 times 10,000 is 200,000? 200,000 years' worth of Wages? By comparison, Herod the Great's annual tax revenue was about 800 talents, an annual tax revenue that he collected with the, from the provinces in the area of the Galilee and the area of Jerusalem that he was, he was over. Only 800 talents tax revenue. This is 10,000 talents. A talent was said to be 20 years of wages, 200,000 years of wages. And a talent of gold in Israel weighed about 200 pounds. So that's 10,000 times 200 is 2 million. 2 million pounds of gold. Now the spot price today, I looked it up, for an ounce of gold is $1,908.23 for an ounce. How many ounces in a pound? See, this is, you're learning a lot. You're, you're gaining talents here. You're good. 16. 16. 16 times 1,908. 16 ounces in a pound. An ounce is 1,908. Equals thirty thousand five hundred and thirty-one dollars and sixty-eight cents for a pound of gold. Times two million. 
equals 61,063,360,000. So if somebody was telling the story today and using gold, 10,000 pounds of gold times 16 ounces, and I hope my math is right. I didn't run it by Seth or David or anybody else who's <laughs> better, better at math than I am. This is kind of quick and dirty. But it almost doesn't matter, does it? And it doesn't matter that we spent five minutes talking about this because that's not the point of <laughs> the parable. We do that sometimes. Well, the servant must have this, and they were, how, how did the king and why, and, and what's, how many talents, and ooh, that's a lot of money. It's the impossibility of it. What did the servant say? I will pay it back. I don't think so. I don't think so. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. That was normal back in the ancient Near East. If somebody couldn't pay their debt, especially a large one, then they could be sold to somebody else to erase that debt. But of course, they're still back in slavery, still being a servant. It's difficult to imagine how a servant at any level or class could even acquire such an enormous debt, but the point of the parable isn't to try and figure it out. The point is how much we are in debt to God. It's purposefully absurd. You can't pay it back. And it makes the man's plea, and what is his plea? As the servant fell on his knees before him, be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. It makes his plea utterly preposterous. To do that. Really? And to do that, <laughs> <laughs> indeed, perhaps the only reason the figure is not placed even higher is that the term translated bags of gold here was the largest currency available and 10,000 was, 10, was the largest numerical designation in Greek. So they took the highest, the most precious metal with the greatest worth with the highest number to give us this idea of how impossible it is. But maybe we, like this man, we believe if we're given enough time, we can work our way out of the situation that we put ourselves in and back into God's good graces. But we can't. There's not enough time. And we don't have what it takes. That's why it's called grace. That isn't how this works. We need mercy. The only one certain thing is that the servant will never ever be able to pay that much money. So he's threatened to have himself and his wife and children and all that he had to be sold to repay the debt. So he falls on his knees. And the Greek here is proskinesis. Proskinesis. And that's used several times in the Bible. Um, it's when you approach a king. A master, you approach the throne, you kneel and bow until your head touches the ground. That's proskinesis. Oftentimes this is also accompanied by kissing the king's feet. And part of this is, part of this is you're humbling yourself before the king, especially if you're in trouble <laughs> and you want to get out of it. You go as low as you can. You kiss his feet, and it's crucial that the petitioner not look at the king, right? If you're looking at someone eye to eye, it kind of puts you on this level ground, doesn't it? Your peers, but you don't look at the king. Rulers would indicate acceptance of this individual, their plea or whatever, by taking the person's chin and lifting it so that he could behold the ruler's gracious countenance. You, you may look at me, I'm going to forgive you. 
I'm going to forgive your debt. We see this in Genesis 33, 1 through 11, with Jacob and Esau. It's an incredible story. And then Psalm 3, 3, you lift my head, the psalmist says of God. It's this imagery, it's the Hebrew equivalent of this Greek word, this imagery of we're prostrating, we're proskinesising before the king, and, this, and he says, you lift up my head. You let me see your face. You see your grace, your countenance. So he does this. And the servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debts, and let him go. It probably wasn't necessarily because he said, I'll pay it back, because the king knew he couldn't pay it back. Not this extravagant, preposterous number. But this is the king's heart. Forgiveness. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Didn't have to pay it back wasn't going to be sold to somebody else to repay the debt, and wasn't going to prison. He let him go. Can you imagine what that would feel like? And what might that do to you? H how might that change your heart? Because the king's heart was changed. And not necessarily because of the goodness of the servant, right? Because apparently the servant... We'll just say he was a tax revenue collector. He's skimming everything off the top, keeping it for himself. Or whatever case, however he's in debt, he owes a lot. But the king shows mercy. The king forgave the servant the whole debt, the punishment, and the money. Forgave it all. All of it. So you would think... Oh I'd, oh, I'd be on cloud nine. Cloud 77, I would be on, right? And you would think it would change this servant's heart. But on his way out, next slide, on his way out. But when the servant went out, one commentary I read was like, the servant going down the stairs from the throne room, right, right after it happened, passed another servant who owed him money, and he grabs him by the throat. On his way out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Okay, even though it's not the point of the parable to what is a hundred silver coins, what, is, what, what do other translations say? A hundred denarii. Den denari. Yeah, hundred. that is a, a form of currency. A hundred denarii, a hundred pence, a hundred silver coins. A silver coin was a denarii, a Roman silver coin, equal to a day's wage. So a hundred days wages instead of 200,000 years of wages, equals to a day's wage. In 27 BC, just a few years before the time of Jesus, a common soldier or unskilled laborer would be paid one denarius a day. And we see this, I believe it's in Matthew 20, where each of the servants was given a denarii uh, for their day of work. And if it was a silver coin, and even though throughout the time of Jesus, the, the, the century before and the century after, they made the denarii with different levels of purity of silver. But let's just, for argument's sake, say that with 99.99% pure silver, right? Let's just say an ounce of silver. So 100 ounces of silver. Silver spot price for an ounce of silver is $23.13 today. Times 100? Or did I miss the 16? No, it's just ounces. It's only 100 ounces, 100 silver coins. $230. He was forgiven preposterously, right? $61 billion. And he passes somebody on the stairs or in the alley or on the street or in the servants' quarters or wherever it is. You owe me $230. And he wrings his throat. I want my $2. If anybody has ever seen the movie Better Off Dead, 
There's these little paper boys that ride around on their bicycle because Lane hasn't paid them the $2 for the paper. And he, they ride throughout and they come in different parts of the movie. I want my $2. That's what this guy's doing. I want my $2. He grabbed him and began to choke him. And I, I find this is quite startling. If we, if we use the typical image of proskinesis and the lifting of the chin, so you could see the grace of the merciful king to see his face. This guy doesn't lift his fellow servant's chin. <laughs> he grabs him by the throat. It says, pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him. Now, as we read this sentence, think back. Where have I heard this before? Be patient with me. And the Greek word here, and when the other servant used it in front of the king, it's, um, it means bowels. So it's better translated compassion. Have compassion on me. Not just wait until I can pay you back, but wait until I can pay you back with compassion. Compassion. Have compassion over me and I will pay it back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. Kind of hard to work off debts when you're in prison. I didn't do as much research on this as I wanted to, but there is this thing called debtor's prison where some people are put under like house arrest. They're, they're, they're in a prison, but they work off their debt. And it's hard to know if, if Jesus is painting us a picture of, 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 of Roman if we can call it secular society, or if this is supposed to be a, a Jewish kind of a story. Um, the, the Jewish Talmudic tradition looked down on debtors' prisons. So, so perhaps it wasn't a debtors' prison, but whatever the case. A lot of times, um, if somebody was put in a debtors' prison, it was a strategy to force a person's family or friends to come up with the cash to pay the debt, to get them out of prison, since they couldn't earn money themselves to pay their way out of prison, debtor's prison. But whatever the case, again, that almost is irrelevant to the story, isn't it? Because it's the attitude of the individual. The servant who was forgiven much couldn't forgive anything. The servant didn't allow the forgiveness and mercy to change him. Interestingly, the king didn't say, go and do likewise, right? I've forgiven you, go and forgive. He didn't tell him to go and be merciful. The king knew that only mercy begets mercy, but the servant didn't seem to know that or let it affect him. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debts. When the other servants saw what happened, they were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. I picture other fellow servants who probably owed this bad servant money too, and they didn't want the same thing to happen to them. So they're just, you know, kind of CYA, you know, cover your, cover, cover your, they, they were protecting themselves. But I'm sure it wasn't just that they were, they didn't want the same thing to happen to them. They, they were outraged. I'm sure the story, the scuttlebutt, the rumors, the gossip, the truth about this man being forgiven so much went like wildfire over the grapevine, right? What a story. Oh, well, now wait a minute. He was forgiven all of that and he can't forgive even a little bit? Oh, that chaps my hide. That drops my socks. That rattles my slacks. Let's go tell the king. 
let's go tell the king because he really should get what's coming to him, right? So he went and told their master everything that had happened. Next slide. Then the master called the servant in, you wicked servant, I canceled all of your debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In his anger, the master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. We've already talked about how can you, first of all, if he had the best job in the world and robbed all the banks in the province, he still wouldn't be able to pay back what he owed, according to the story. So how in the world is he going to be able to pay? And then Jesus says, this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or sister from your heart. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And you'll have to edit this pause out, but I will tell the crowd here, I am strategically working through my notes to see what I can... (laughs) Not because of you, Tina, but the master of the house. (laughs) Pastor N. No, I'm I'm trying to figure out if it it goes in this place or not. Oh, okay. (laughs) So when we, we saw it with Lamech, the most possible attitude of society was revenge, judgment, right? You did something wrong with, to me, I'm going to do something back to you. There, there is a place of using judgment, of course, and knowing the, 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 the fruit of someone's actions or consequences, there's judgment, but it's so easy to be judgmental. Right to put you yourself in the place of the judge and meet out the consequences instead of letting natural consequences or the law of the land consequences to take place. But but if we if we participate in this vengeful right the the servant was was exacting maybe not revenge but he was he 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 was getting what was due him it's it's justice it's his form of justice to get back his $230. As we contribute to this atmosphere of judgment, we help create a world we can't survive in. Lamech's world didn't survive. Noah's world didn't survive. It's a world too dangerous for sinners to inhabit. We're like, sinners? Sinners shouldn't inhabit the world. Wait a second. <laughs> we're all sinners. And when we make mistakes. And if all we're under is somebody else's judgment in their form of justice, their idea of justice, then we're all up a creek. Judgment is the enemy of faith because faith is delivered and sustained through grace, forgiveness, forgiveness. As we judge and demand payment from one another, we fashion a world not only skeptical of forgiveness, grace, and mercy, but also we become downright opposed to it because it's not fair. (laughs) Jesus is telling a story about what happens when forgetful sinners, right? This person somehow (laughs) forgot how much he had been forgiven. But it's a story about what happens when forgetful sinners demand justice. And so we judge not, lest we construct a machine, a society, a system out to destroy the very essence of the kingdom of God. And that essence is faith, grace, mercy, and forgiveness. Forgiveness involves the absorption of wrong. It is to release someone of a debt genuinely owed. For this reason, forgiveness can actually feel wrong. Sometimes, can't it? It seems like you're letting someone get away with something that you shouldn't. By saying, I forgive you, it seems like you 
When you say that, you hear the sound of keys unlocking the door of a prison cell that justice says should be remain locked forever. It keeps the writing on the chalkboard. If you, if you notice the, the, the logo, the, the sermon logo, it's a chalkboard with an eraser spot on it in the word 77. But we like to write on the chalkboard. We don't like erasing the chalkboard. Judgment keeps the writing on the chalkboard. So the fellow slaves inform the king of this brutality and mercilessness. And perhaps they owe the servant money and don't want the same thing to happen to them, as I mentioned. And of course, just the sheer unbelief that one who was forgiven much now forgives so little. We are to take this individualistically as far as forgiveness is concerned. Peter asks, how many times shall I forgive my brother? Harms and hurts are, are personal. Forgiveness is personal. But Jesus is also dealing with the whole nation of Israel as well, a community of people, God's people. How does forgiveness work and what does it look like in a community? And what happens to a community, not just individuals, but a community when unforgiveness rules the day? Gerhard Lofink, I love that name, Gerhard Lofink, although it was probably not good as a kid, I would imagine. But Gerhard Lofink in his book, The 40 Parables of Jesus, says, It is true that we are to respond to God's prolific mercy with the same mercy towards others, but that does not say it all. This is about the people of God now, and Jesus, when he was talking to them then, in this hour, in that hour when it was spoken, when the reign of God is happening, and God offers the totality of divine mercy to Israel, to us, through Jesus, and the people of God, and everyone who hears Jesus' message not only to those who hear and maybe start to get it, but also those who are opposed to them, the opposed to Jesus, who are against him. They hear it and they take offense at his mercy towards sinners. But they must now live, when they hear it, when they respond to it, live that divine mercy themselves. They can make their lives correspond to God's action by entering into a new relationship with one another. They can, we can, as people live it out. And if we don't, their world, our world, the world will remain as it is. In the history of threats and eruptions and violence and senseless wars and endless suffering, torture brought on by themselves will continue. And I want to commit to you that this line, this is how it talks about being tortured until you should be paid back all he owes. This is how your heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive. We get this image of, oh no, if I don't forgive, I'm going to be in some kind of divine, spiritual prison forever to be tortured. But we do our own torturing to ourselves when we live in a state of unforgiveness. It's a torture of our own design. It's a torture of our own choice. And the way to get out of that torture, to get out of that prison, to get out of debtor's prison, is to know we're forgiven and to forgive others from our So when it says heart in the Bible, I mentioned this a couple of um, weeks ago. When we think of our decision-making process and our will, right, we think of up here, the brain. And remember I, I said that Tim, Tim Mackey enlightened us. There is no word in the Bible for brain. 
the, there's more of a amalgamation, more of a idea of that the seat of your will, your choice, your decision-making process, and your feelings is the heart, when they speak of the heart. When we think of it today, choices, will, decisions, feelings is the heart, right? Emotions. But the decision-making process is the brain. It's a little bit more meshed in the Hebrew thought. We're to make the decision to forgive. It's a choice. And a choice you may not like. And it doesn't feel good. And it's going from the easy way, which is vengeance, vengeance, the little mech way, that's the easy way, to the hard way of forgiveness. But if you make that choice, from your heart, knowing that you've been forgiven, then the, f- the feeling <laughs> will follow. doesn't mean you still won't be angry or when years down the road you think of it again and it kind of gets you all, you know, you want to choke somebody out. <laughs> but it releases you from your prison. Because unforgiveness makes us irrational, a state of vengeful frenzy. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. That is lunatical, right? That's, that's frenzy, a state of vengeful frenzy. And it stops being about justice a long time ago. You don't want this person to be able to pay you back. You don't even want to give them a chance to make amends or to make things right. When when the fellow servant said, be patient with me, have compassion on me, and I'll pay you back, nope, talk to the hand. I'm not listening. You're getting the boot into prison. I don't even want you to have a chance to make amends, to pay it back. To make it right. It's Lamech. It's human nature. It's what we do. Tim Mackey says it's the spiral of history. We don't want justice. Justice makes things right. It puts people in right relationship. That's justice. We want our own form of justice. Where they get theirs. We want to make the person suffer. We want the satisfaction of at least a short little (laughs) chokehold because they owe me big time. (laughs) We We want to put the person in an impossible situation or position so that they can know what they did to me. Forgiveness is a decision to give up what is by nature revenge, Vengeance, retaliation, and even certain rights to retaliate or get back. It's a release of what you could do but choose not to. That's forgiveness. Refusing to put the person in a scenario where it would be impossible for this person to make anything up to you. I was going to make a list because when we, when we talk about forgiveness, there are a lot of things that forgiveness is not. Sometimes it's, we get confused. We misunderstand that forgiveness means I have to forget about it or I have to act like nothing happened or that person shouldn't suffer any consequences. That is not forgiveness. I would uh, recommend to you after this sermon, and you you might hear some words that are similar to what you hear if you listen to Tim Mackey's sermon. Tim Mackey's sermon, August 20th, 2017. All you have to do is Google Tim Mackey, Matthew, and the YouTube list will come up. He gave a sermon series in the book of Matthew in 2017. I think it took him all year, (laughs) and you thought we went long. But it's, 
it's sermon number 27, and it's on Matthew 18, this very specific uh, part. And I, I took a few ideas from him, and I'm giving him credit specifically for what's on the next couple of slides. So go ahead, and we'll talk about what forgiveness is not in Matthew 18, and we'll go through this um, quickly uh, because you can um, watch his sermon on YouTube. Tim Mackey, space, Matthew, and then YouTube will come up, and it's number 27, sermon number 27. They, they gave 27 sermons on Matthew, and they were only in Matthew 18. Oh, wow. Everyone worth it, absolutely. And I was going to make a list, too, because we can confuse reconciliation and restoration and forgiveness and whose part is what part. Um, and some people think, oh, if I forgive them, then sadly, even in the Christian world, there have been too many church leaders or pastors say, you have to stay with this person. Forgive them and stay with this abusive person. No. That's not forgiveness. You can forgive the person, but you can get out. I'm talking about domestic violence and abuse. What forgiveness is not? It's not ignoring or forgetting. When you forgive someone, you're not ignoring the problem. And you're not forgetting. There's this saying, forgive and forget. <laughs> Wish I could use more colorful language. But that's hooey. First of all, we can't forget. Sometimes it's remembering that protects you in the future. And we say, well, God forgives and forgets. Well, I'm sure he has the ability to do that. But here's the thing is, he forgives and remembers and forgives us <laughs> anyway. Okay, that's another sermon. Condoning or excusing. Forgiving somebody doesn't mean you're saying what you did is okay or what you did doesn't matter. That's not forgiveness. Tolerating or allowing further abuse. You can forgive someone, seeing them as a human being, broken and flawed, and maybe even really messed up. But Anne was talking about seeing each other's humanity in the play-sharing piece. Forgiveness is seeing their humanity but it's not staying in a place where you can continue to be abused. Forgiveness is not reconciliation or restoration. Reconciliation and restoration, we're going to look at a text in Matt, just before um, Matthew 18. Is it, what verses did we look at? 21 through 35. The, the section before it talks about the reconciliation and the restoration process. But forgiveness is not reconciliation or restoration because that takes both parties coming to a place of peace, of reconciliation, of restoration. Forgiveness is about you, your heart, your attitude and motivations, whether the other person changes or not. That's why it's kind of easy to see, yeah, I guess you could get to 77 times because that person's not changing. But that doesn't e you mean you need to remain in their orbit. <laughs> but you can still forgive. But it, forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation or restoration. See, Tim Mackey, Sermon, Matthew. In case he ever watches this, I'm giving him credit. And I'm not that smart anyway, so. I mean, I would have come up with a list and it might have looked like this, but he, sa he <laughs> saved me the time. It's not returning back to the way things were before. For forgiveness is a healing process where, in most cases, you are able to move on, heal, become more whole, and hopefully even flourish. But forgiving doesn't mean, well, I've got to go back to that. And forgiveness isn't allowing the offender to escape consequences. There are consequences for people's actions. 
I've, I've read several stories, and Tim gives an example of this at the end of a sermon, and I can't remember the names, but I think it was at the, the church in Charleston where at a Bible study an individual comes in, sits through the whole thing, and kills nine people. And one of the daughters of a 71-year-old woman who was killed said to the murderer, we forgive you. But she didn't turn to the lawyers or the police or the judge and say, so don't charge him with any crimes. No, he's going to pay the consequences for what he did. But the daughter said, we forgive you. We offer mercy. That's the hard thing, isn't it? That's the hard thing. So when we talk about reconciliation and restoration, let's go to Matthew 18, 15 through 20 real quick. I think it's either, yeah, here we go. So this is right before 70 times 7, Peter asked 7 times, no, 77 times, here's the parable. If your brother or sister sins, go and point out their fault, right? So already we're seeing that you're not ignoring it or forgetting it, you're taking action. You're dealing with it. You've been offended, you've been hurt. Something's been done against you by your brother or sister. Go and point out their fault just between the two of you. And I would add a caveat, if it's safe. There are some levels <laughs> of hurt and pain, and this person is unsafe to be with just the two of you. But if you can, just between the two of you, if they listen to you, you have won them over, right? If they own their part, they apologize, they realize what they did was wrong, and they're, what, what they're wrong, and they're willing to take steps to, to make amends or, or, or even change, then you won them over. But if they will not listen, I don't care. I'm going to do it again. Take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. Take somebody along, somebody who, <laughs> you know, is level-headed, wise, knows the situation. And say, hey, this behavior is not good. You hurt me, and we don't want you to continue to hurt me or other people. If they refuse to listen, they don't own up, they don't take accountability, tell it to the church. Now, it's not like taking a microphone and announcements, this person did this to me! Church! <laughs> church, church leaders, right? And if they refuse to listen, even to the church, treat them as you would a pagan or a tax collector. So this, this is about reconciliation, going to someone. and looking for a restoration or reconciliation process. It's interesting, these are three steps, and, and the tradition of forgiving is three times. But this is a different process than forgiveness. Treat them as you would a pagan or tax collector. And one little tidbit about that, these, these were mostly a Jewish audience listening, and how did most Jewish people treat Gentiles or pagans and tax collectors? Terribly. <laughs> we have nothing to do with you. Get out. Stay away. But how did, how did Jesus deal with Gentiles and tax collectors? He brought them in. He loved them. He treated them like human beings. So even... Even if they don't listen to the church, it doesn't mean that you give up on that person. Jesus continually, even just before this, he talks about going after the lost sheep. Certainly there are circumstances and times when an unrepentant sinner or somebody who doesn't own what they're doing and is a danger to a community, to the church, an abuser, then no, they can't be a part of that community. But that doesn't mean that they're worthless. It doesn't mean we throw them away. We treat them as Jesus treated Gentiles and tax collectors. So what is forgiveness in Matthew 18? Matthew 18. 
It's giving up my right to retaliate personally, right? To retaliate. It's changing my heart attitude towards the offender, remembering that God has forgiven me. And I love the story because how much have we been forgiven? 61 billion, <laughs> right? In an, an unimaginable amount, something that we cannot repay. The first step is to remember what God has done for me, for us. And sometimes we think, though, that what the person has done to me, what he owes me, is way more than what I have done to God and his good world and what I owe him. We forget. Sometimes we can create that kind of high ground over someone else, right? I haven't messed up as much as this person has and they deserve it. We create this kind of high ground over someone else. So just a little chokehold, just a little kick out. It's all do me. It's the moment that I've completely forgotten what it means to be a Christian, what it means to be a follower of Jesus, because we're throwing out mercy and grace and forgiveness and using judgment in our own form of justice. But when we see and acknowledge our brokenness and we see and seek humility, when we see that we each, all of us are forgiven by God, we're able to get a glimmer of someone else's humanity and to be able to forgive them. It's rediscovering their humanity and offering compassion, patience from the bowels, <laughs> compassion on that person. And all of these, these really aren't even steps because forgiveness is hard and it takes time and it's a process. And, and I wonder if that's 77 times, it could be for one single offense and every day you have to say to yourself, I forgive them, I forgive them, I forgive them. It's a choice until it actually moves to your heart. You may have to say it 77 times. Jesus tells the story to illustrate that we don't understand the enormity of God's forgiveness or the danger of our unforgiveness. That's kind of what that little piece at the end about God will treat you the same way. It's the danger of unforgiveness. He knows what unforgiveness does to us. We're tortured on the inside. We're in our own prison. And if you want a little help with the forgiveness process, there's a book, I think it was written in 1997, next slide, by Lewis Smeads, The Art of Forgiving, When You Need to Forgive and Don't Know How. He said this, it's a famous quote, When we forgive, we set a prisoner free and discover that the prisoner we set free is us. It's us. It's no accident that the unforgiving servant ends up in a cell. That is where all unforgiveness takes us in the end. Jesus means for us to be free, and to be free, we must be forgiven. And to remain free, we must forgive. To move from the easy thing, the Lamech model, to the Jesus model, from the easy to the hard. And it is hard. It's no accident that the unforgiving servant ends up in a cell. That's where all unforgiveness takes us in the end, a prison. Jesus means for us to be free, and to be free, we must be forgiven. And we are forgiven. The parable illustrates that. Jesus' life, death, resurrection, and ascension, his death on the cross, that proves our forgiveness. And to remain free, to get out of our own prison, we must forgive. God has forgiven the justified and the ungodly. All debts 
have been forgiven. All cell doors have been unlocked in all slates wiped clean. Last slide. Our sins have been forgiven. The debt has been paid. The slate wiped clean. We are free. May we live in the freedom of forgiveness and forgive others. May we free ourselves from the prison of hatred, retaliation, and vengeance. Instead, may we show mercy as we have been shown mercy. May we move from the easy thing to the hard thing and forgive. Seventy-seven. stand with me as we conclude and sing about the forgiveness that comes from the Father at the altar. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. forgiven me that just blew my mind limitless oh what a savior isn't he wonderful sing alleluia christ is risen bow down before Oh, 
come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of jesus christ oh come to the altar the father's arms are open wide forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you for your forgiveness. May we walk in that today. All God's children said, amen. All right, David, take us out. You know what it feels like to live in forgiveness? It's like this. Like we this. will live, live with, with Jesus, Jesus, love with, with Jesus, Jesus, and lead people, people with, with Jesus. Jesus. And all God's children said, Amen. <laughs> oh, we have banana bread and coffee cake. Thank you for bringing the coffee cake, Marie. So feel free to help yourselves to some snacks. And we'll slide the Zoom screen over so you can say hi all, to all your, as Mark calls them, Zoomerific people. We'll see you next week. Love you.